I neglected before the offering to mention the kids can be dismissed, so I'm doing that now. And uh, kids, you can be dismissed to go to 252. And uh, is Miss Wendy back there, or is she already back in the fellowship hall? She's she's waiting for you. They they made it out. So anybody that didn't make it out, you can you can go now. I my my bad. A um, couple of things before I. Uh, before I talk to you about uh, what I want to talk to you about for this morning and for the next three weeks. Uh, number one, and Deborah did mention this earlier, uh, men, the district retreat is coming up uh, March 10 and 11. It is up at the Quality Inn Conference Center up at uh, um, Highway 281 and I-80. I'd, I'd like to have 15 to 20 guys from this church to go. I have got, I have got my registration form right here filled out, and I hope that you will fill one out for the cost for the retreat without, you can sleep in your own bed because it's so close. We don't have to pay for overnight lodging. It's $65 for Friday night and Saturday and that's dinner on Friday and lunch on Saturday and a continental breakfast. It's a pretty good deal and uh, Jim Deal, um, many of you know that name. Jim Deal was the former district, su uh, district superintendent in Nebraska, um, former general superintendent of the Church of the Nazarene. My nickname for him is the man with a million stories. And, and uh, he's got great stories and makes great application of those. And I think it's really neat that we'll have them here. So, guys, let me encourage you to pick up the registration forms. They're located out on the, the desk in the lobby. If we run out, don't worry, we'll make more. We've got more we can make. But uh, I would really encourage you to do that. I think the deadline to register is February 27th because we got to get the count to the, the people that are the meal providers there at the hotel. So we've got a couple of weeks, I encourage you to do that. Second thing, I wanted to pass along uh, a good bit of news. Uh, many of you uh, that have been here for a number of years know uh, Jeff and Tracy Kimberly. They were a part of the church when uh, when Angie and I moved to Hastings five and a half years ago, and Jeff sensed the call of God on his life, and about two and a half, three years ago, uh, transitioned to pastor the Church of the Nazarene in Superior, Nebraska. And Superior is a small community, small church, and God's been doing some really neat stuff down there, not the least of which is a church that was going out of business gave them their building, and so they've been working here the past year, maybe a little bit longer, on converting their, the, what was their building into a child care center that can serve that community. That community has no dedicated child care center. The one that was in operation went out of business, only had in-home providers. And so I know a number of you uh, went down there. There were some volunteer work days. I know that Deborah and I think Ora, you were down there for a volunteer work day. And some others of you may have gone down as well and participated in, in trying to do all the things that are necessary to convert a church facility into a facility that meets all the requirements of licensing by the state of Nebraska for a child care facility. The reason I went through all of that was to tell you um, this past Tuesday, they got approval from the state of Nebraska to open and operate, and so they're going to start launching on March 1st, which is pretty cool. And I know that uh, many of you have been thinking about them and praying for them and, 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 like I said, have gone down there and helped with some of the stuff that needed to be done. I mean, some of the work, it was not glamorous work at all. And um, and I just wanted to sit there and say your work is going to make a difference in that community. And that's one of the neat things about being a part of a connectional church like ours is that we can have impact in areas that we don't even know and aren't even aware of. And, and certainly some of you have done some things to where we're going to have impact in Superior. As kids throughout the community are going to have a Christ-centered place where they can go while mom and dad works that can begin to sow seeds into their lives that can make a difference. So I just wanted you to be aware of that as well and celebrate together what God's doing in Superior through Jeff and Tracy and continue to keep them in your prayers as well. One of my uh, favorite writers and communicators is a guy um, named John Ortberg. I don't know if that name means anything to you or not. John Ortberg, he pastors a, a, a large church. It's located in the Bay Area of California. And, and a few years ago, I, I was at a conference and I heard uh, him speak. 
And, and he did a talk that was one of the most powerful things I'd, I'd ever heard. And, and uh, he was talking about leadership. And he was talking about the, the, the challenges and the, the, the isolation and the relentless demands of leadership and, and how the challenges and, and how those things can inspire a variety of fears within the leader's heart. But he said the greatest fear that a leader faces is not, is not anything that can happen to them, but it's something that can happen within them. And he said that, that, that what can happen is there can be this degeneration that, that, that takes place within us that, that robs us of our calling and, and leaves us with a deep sense of dissatisfaction embedded within our hearts. And, and the terms he used to describe that was the terms mission and shadow mission. He said, what can happen is a leader can forsake and abandon the mission and can embrace a shadow mission. And not too long ago, it was over the Christmas break actually, I, I, was, I, I was cleaning some old documents off my laptop. I was getting error messages about my, lap, my hard drive being full and there was, so I was thinking, I need to get rid of some stuff. So I was cleaning some old documents off my laptop. And I came across my notes from that session. And, and I opened them and reread them. And I was again moved in my spirit as I kind of read what I'd, what I'd captured. But I also sensed the Lord kind of saying that perhaps I ought to share those thoughts and insights and expand on them a little bit with you. And so that's what I want us to do for today and for the next couple of weeks. I want us to look at that. Very little of this is original, but, but it's really, really good stuff. And, and I, I, I want us to explore it. And I want us to do so by looking at a story from the Bible that, that he drew on when he shared uh, this at that uh, conference I was attending. It's a story many of us are probably familiar with, but it's a story that, that, that many of us may not realize just how relevant, just just how pertinent it is to our lives. It's from the Old Testament. It's the story of Esther. And it's a story that, that, that when you read through it, it's filled with characters that are given a choice between embracing their true mission and adopting a shadow mission. The, the book of Esther is set in the city of Susa. Susa is the capital of Persia. And the Hebrew people, they've been overrun, they've been transported to this foreign land where they're in exile. And the book begins by introducing us to King Euxes. Esther chapter 1 verse 1, it says, This is what happened during the time of Euxes. The Yerk, I guess there were many Yerkeses because it says the Yerkeses who ruled over 127 provinces stretching from India to Kush. It's clarifying for us which Yerkeses it's talking about. This is what happened during the time of Yerkeses. He ruled over 127 provinces stretching from India to Kush. Kush is basically Egypt, Ethiopia, that part of the world. So this is a vast empire. There, there is pretty much the, the entirety of the known world at that time. So, so Euxes, he, he's a man of immense power. Um, and being a man of immense power, he's used to getting his way. And as you read on, he's also a guy that's bought into a very powerful and uh, debilitating shadow mission. Instead of being an accountable leader, instead of being a responsible man who seeks to do justice and who seeks to serve the poor and to protect the, the vulnerable and create a flourishing society, Euxes has embraced the shadow mission of looking impressive and experiencing pleasure and following the path of least resistance. He's, he, he's preoccupied with, with, with showing off his greatness. He's, he, he wants to use his vast resources in a way that will cause people around him to like him and defer to him. 
And, and the first time that we see Xerxes, he's throwing a banquet for his noblemen. Picking it up, verse 3, it says, In the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his nobles and officials. And the military leaders of Persia and Media, the princes and the nobles of the provinces were present. For a full 180 days, he displayed the vast wealth of his kingdom and the splendor and glory of his majesty. Six months, 180 days, where the agenda was, let's party. No restraint, no restrictions. Six months of Animal House. And that makes you realize that this, is, this is a bunch of high integrity character guys that you know, we're talking about here. You know, it's a picture of excess. It's a picture of exorbitance that's all about him, about serving his pleasure, about propping up his ego. I mean, look, look at the indulgence. Look at the overkill. We pick it up verse 7. It says, Wine was served in goblets of gold, each one different from the other, and the royal wine was abundant in keeping with the king's liberality. By the king's command, each guest was allowed to drink in his own way. For the king instructed all the wine stewards to serve each man what he wished. Now one of the realities is that when you are doing what King Euxes is doing, you aren't necessarily thinking clearly. And you aren't in the best frame of mind to make the wisest choices. And Euxes goes down that path, verse 10. It says, On the seventh day, when King Euxes was in high spirits from wine, he commanded the seven eunuchs who served him, and then it names them, to bring before him Queen Vashti, wearing her royal crown in order to display her beauty to the people and nobles. For she was lovely to look at. You know, for, for, the, for, the, for, for this entire party, Euxes has been kind of showing off all his possessions and all his wealth, and he decides he's going to bring out and show off his ultimate possession, which is his wife, the queen. Now, a quick question for you to think about here. What do you think it was about her that he wanted to show them? You think he wanted them to see her brains and her intellect? <laughs> you, you think he, he wanted her to dazzle them with her ability to solve complex math equations? You know, maybe lead, that, lead them in some intellectually riveting discussion over some pressing social problem of that day? Not so much. He wanted to bring her in because, like that 11th verse says, she was lovely to look at. So, okay, ladies, put yourself in this story. Are you humiliated? Are you, are you embarrassed? You bet. So I want you to see what, what Queen Vashti did. Something that had she not done it, the rest of the book of Esther would have never been written. The heroism of Esther would have never taken place. Look at verse 12, the first part of that verse. It says, But when the attendants delivered the king's command, Queen Vashti refused to come. Good for her. <laughs> You know, come and parade myself in front of a crazed mob of guys who are behaving like a boozy bunch of college kids in Daytona Beach on spring break? <laughs> Don't think so. Now, how do you think Yerxes responds to this? Do you think he sits there and says, Oh, Vashti, my dear, you're, you're, you're right. That, that was so insensitive of me. That, that, that must have been so awkward for you. I am, I, I am so sorry. My bad. I think that's how it responds? Not quite. Look at the last half of that 12th verse. 
It says, Then the king became furious and burned with anger. You see, Vashti was making him look weak. She was endangering. She, she was threatening his shadow mission. I mean, if you read through the book of Esther, there's a, there's a ton of irony in this story. It's just all over the place. And we're going to get into some as we pick it up. Verse 13. It says, Since it was customary for the king to consult experts in matter of the law and justice, he spoke with the wise men who understood the laws, and then it names them in verse, verse 14. Going down verse 15. According to the law, what must be done to Queen Vashti, he asked. She's not obeyed the command of King Xerxes that the eunuchs have taken to her. And then Mamukan replied in the presence of the king and the nobles, Queen Vashti has done wrong. Not only against the king, but also against all the nobles and all the peoples of all the provinces of King Xerxes. She's done wrong by the entire empire, he says. For the queen's conduct will become known to all women. And so they'll despise their husbands and they'll say King Yurtzis commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, but she would not come. This very day, the Persian and Median women of the nobility who have heard about the queen's conduct will respond to all the king nobles in the same way. There'll be no end of disrespect and discord. I mean, the most powerful guy in the world, he can't control his wife. <laughs> and so he makes it a matter of state and he calls in his key advisors together and he says what are we going to do about this if word gets out every wife throughout the empire is going to become unruly things are going to get out of hand so look, look on verse 19 and it says therefore if it pleases the king, let him issue a royal decree and let it be written in the laws of Persia and Media, which cannot be repealed, that Vashti is never again to enter the presence of King Xerxes. Also let the king give her royal position to somebody else who is better than she. Seriously. That's her punishment. To not be able to come in the presence of this man who made this tasteless, vulgar request in the first place. I'm guessing she's heartbroken. <laughs> she's just devastated. But that, that's their solution. Their solution is ban Vashti and begin the process of finding a replacement queen. Their rationale being verse 20. Then when the king's edict is proclaimed throughout all his vast realm, all the women will respect their husbands from the least to the greatest. Yeah, that'll happen. <laughs> you know, as I, as I was thinking about this, As I was thinking about this, it dawned on me that part of the God-given mission for a healthy marriage, or for any relationship for that matter, but particularly for a marriage, part of the God-given mission for that relationship is that each help the other become a better person. I mean, marriage is a, marriage is a great workshop for spiritual formation. <laughs> Because the person that you're married to sees your flaws and weaknesses more clearly than anybody else. And the God-given mission for marriage means that you'll need to express love. You'll need to express encouragement. You'll, 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 need, to, you'll, you'll need to confront difficult situations. You'll, you'll need to handle conflict in productive ways. You'll need to tell the truth. Now, now Xerxes, he, he doesn't want that from his wife. That, that, that's not his agenda. He, he, he wants a compliant, subservient piece of arm candy. 
He, he wants someone who will stroke his ego. He wants someone who will make him feel powerful. And Vashti says, I don't want that. That's not for me. She wouldn't do it. Now, as advisors would, you know, part of what's going on here in, in the first chapter of the book of Esther, part of what's happening is that the writer is showing us what flatterers and back scratchers these advisors were. I mean, they, 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 they talk about his, his, his edict being spread throughout the entire realm and how, how vast and magnificent his, his, his empire is. And they spoke about how, how authoritative and influential his words would be and how it would shape the way that husbands and wives interact throughout the entire impact, uh, and through the entire empire. I mean, they, they, these guys, they are laying it on really, really thick. <laughs> But we shouldn't really be surprised because King Xerxes, he surrounded himself with people who are committed to reinforcing his shadow mission. And, and one of the things about this is, is people, people who are committed to reinforcing your shadow mission won't level with you and tell you the truth. They'll find a way to tell you what they think you want to hear rather than to tell you the truth. And, 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 and one of the signs that a shadow mission has taken over is when the people beneath the leader have become more concerned about the leader's perception of reality than they are about the reality itself. And, and, and when that happens, there's a sense in which the institution or the organization or the association or the company or, or whatever, it's, that, that it's, it embraces a shadow mission of its own, which is let's placate the head guy or gal. This is really good stuff that you didn't know was in the Bible, did you? Uh, I want to push the pause button right, right now. We're going we're to pick up the rest of the story the, the next couple of weeks, but I want to push the, the, the pause button because I want you to reflect on a question that all of us need to confront, and the question's this. What is your shadow mission? What is your shadow mission? What is it that pulls you and tempts you and tries to entice you to abandon what God wants for you? What, what, what is it that tantalizes you? What is it that appeals to your emotions, that seduces your heart in ways to where you're tempted to let go of God's highest desire and God's deepest aspiration for you? Because the fact is, folks, all of us have something. All of us have something. That if we're not careful, it'll take our desires, it'll take our longings, our gifts, our abilities, our passions. It'll take them and it'll twist them off track just enough to where we end up really, really far afield. You see, that's the problematic thing about the shadow mission. Is the shadow mission typically isn't 180 degrees opposite of the way we're wired. I mean, if that was the case, we could say no to that really, really easily. Typically, our shadow mission is only 5 to 10 degrees off. But if you keep going that way for an extended period of time, it's not too long before you're really, really out there and far off course. Our shadow mission is something that is let me put it this way. It's, it's something that involves us but is meant to include God and other people and transforms into something that's primarily about us. And, and like I said, what happens is when we pursue it for an extended amount of time, we can end up badly off course. We can end up way off the mark. I mean, the beginning of time, when, when God created the human race, He, he gave us a mission. 
On the same day that God created us, He also entrusted us with a significant responsibility. He said, I want you to care for all I've created. I want you to cause it to flourish by partnering with me, by working together under my authority. And that is the very, very first mission statement. Genesis 1. On the same day that God gave us life, He also gave us a calling, a mission. I want you to prosper. I want you to reproduce. I want you to fill the earth. And I want you to be responsible for every living thing that moves upon the planet. Folks, we're made by God to make a difference. That's why we love great causes. That's why we feel irrelevant and unimportant when we don't have something noble or something meaningful to give ourselves to. Because embedded within each of us is this God-like nature to where we need to have a purpose. I mean, it's, it's, it's in our DNA. It's implanted in us. But then comes the shadow mission from the evil one. And he says, disobey God. Eat the forbidden fruit. Exalt your own ego. You'll, you, you'll be just like God if you do that. I mean, it's so amazing. Our mission is to serve God. Our shadow mission is to replace God. And this thing that's supposed to be a source of joy and satisfaction and to help us feel closer to God becomes a burden and an encumbrance that fosters resentment and leaves us feeling distant from God even though quite often we're doing what we're doing because we believe it'll help us earn His approval. It's twisted. If you read the Bible through this filter, there are a lot of characters who were tempted by a shadow mission. For Solomon, it was worldly wealth. It was pleasure. For Jonah, it was comfort. Escape. For, for the Pharisees, it was being seen as holier than everybody else. It was religion that was their shadow mission. For Pilate, it was avoiding responsibility. In fact, there, there, there's a little known guy in the book of Acts. It's, uh, the stories, I think, in Acts chapter 8. His name's Simon the Sorcerer. <coughs> His shadow mission was to have a spectacular and successful ministry. In fact, I believe Jesus had a shadow mission. Not, not that he ever succumbed to it. I don't believe he did. But I believe it was a very real temptation in his life. I believe the shadow mission of Jesus was to be the Messiah without suffering. To identify some less costly way to fulfill the call that God had placed upon his life. Some path that didn't involve adversity. Some path that didn't require death. I mean, go back and let's revisit the temptation that Jesus went through at the outset of his ministry. You recall that Jesus went off the grid for 40 days and he encountered Satan in the wilderness and the evil one placed before him an array of inducements. First, Satan tempts Jesus to achieve his mission without hunger. Hey, turn these stones into bread, Jesus. It'll be spectacular. And then he tempts him to achieve his mission without pain. Hey, 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 throw yourself down from the temple. The angels, they'll bear you up. You won't have to hurt. And then he finally tempts him to try to achieve his mission without opposition. Just bow down before me and all the kingdoms of the earth, they'll be yours. And Jesus says, no. No, no. 
would take me off course. I've, I've got to suffer. You know, and later on, when Jesus is with His disciples, toward, towards the end of His uh, earthly ministry, He tells His disciples that He's got to suffer and die. Matthew chapter 16 records an instance where the Apostle Peter tries to convince Jesus that his suffering is unnecessary. And it says, verse 23 of Matthew 16, that Jesus turned to Peter and said, Out of my sight, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me because you do not have in mind the things of God but the things of men. Well, I mean, those are harsh, severe, sharp words. That Jesus offers Peter, and you think, why were they so harsh? I think because Peter just reintroduced Jesus to his shadow mission. He tried to talk Jesus into doing something that would cause him to default on God's primary calling on his life. And that's why I believe Jesus told Peter, you don't have in mind the things of God. You've got earthly things in your thinking. Because Peter, Peter had just given voice to this alluring temptation that had Jesus given in to it. It would have caused him to bypass and sidestep the fundamental, the primary thing that God wanted him to do. The thing that we celebrated just a few moments ago when we partook of the bread and the cup. In fact, if you, if you jump ahead and, and, and go into the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus' contentious struggle on the eve of His crucifixion. That's the primary issue He's wrestling with there. He's tangling with this shadow mission to be the Messiah without the cross. To, 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 to back out, to, to choose some less costly way of trying to fulfill God's call upon his life. Father, let this cup pass from me. But he didn't. He resisted and he withstood the allurement of his shadow mission to the very end. And so I, I, I want to pose before you that question again. What is your shadow mission? For some of us, it's... I don't care who's in charge as long as it's me. For some of us, it's... I really need to be needed. Will you need me? For, for some of us, it's successfully avoiding conflict and shoving important stuff under the rug for 25 years. Or, or, or maybe it's passing judgment in the privacy of my heart and feeling smug about it. Or maybe it's pressuring my kids to overachieve so my peers will think I'm the perfect parent. What is your shadow mission? What is the, the, the come on that you've got to constantly do battle with that were you to capitulate to it, it would keep God from maximizing the kingdom potential He's placed in your life? Because here's the deal. Here's the deal, folks. You'll never be able to overcome your shadow mission just by trying to avoid it. The only way you can avoid it and overcome it is by replacing it with something better. Something superior. Something more noble. Something compelling. Something that God created specifically and especially for you. Folks, we were made to discover and devote ourselves to the mission that God has for us. So how do we do that? Let's go back to the story of Esther real, real quick. After Yerxes cools off a bit and sobers up, he realizes, you know what? I've no longer got a queen. 
And so he gets advice on how to find a new one and his choice ends up being this Hebrew girl named Esther. And she's beautiful. And she's gracious. And she just happens to be a part of the people of God. Remember the Hebrews, they're, they're, they're living in exile. Look for all the world like the, you know, this, the, this mission that they had of building a thriving nation that could serve as a beacon to the rest of the world. It looked like that mission is over. But Esther in exile gets to be queen. And she is going to have to decide in the coming days between her shadow mission and her God-given mission. They'll be put side by side. And she's going to have to choose. So folks, if you want to know what happens next, if you want to know how to discover your mission, from this place that God has you right now. If you, if you want to know what God is up to in you by giving you hard situations and why it is that you face difficult circumstances and tough obstacles. If you want to know how you can verify what God has given you so that you can achieve what He's calling you to do. If you want to know that, you got to come back next week. <laughs> because we're going to pick up the story. And we're going to address these issues as we continue to look at how we can overcome our shadow mission. Would you stand with me? Let's wrap up in prayer. Father God, again, we're, we're amazed at how by your Spirit you can take a story that's hundreds, thousands of years old and boil it down to make it so pertinent and relevant and applicable to our lives. And so, Father, we want to be open. We want to receive what you have for us so we can be people that are on mission with you. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for stepping into this room and meeting with us. And thank you for the assurance that you will accompany us as we go from this place. You know what we'll deal with in the hours and days to come. We want you to be there with us so we're not by ourselves, but we're together embracing and handling and working through those circumstances. Father, we ask your blessing. And we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake we pray. Amen. Amen. Folks, thanks for being here. Have a great day. See you soon.